All right, I want to talk about feeder wires in HO scale for a minute. All right, so what you see right there is a spot where I removed a couple of switches. Uh, they were power routing switches. If you're not familiar with power routing switches, uh, somewhere over here, I got a bag full of them. Let's take a look. Let's see. Somewhere over here. Oh my goodness, what do we got in here? Holy cow. Power routing switches. Whole bag full of them. Now, if you've ever seen these at a train show, they're usually only a couple of bucks. And the thing with power routing switches, they were cutting edge back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, before DCC. And I'm wiring up this layout for DCC. And I wanted to use a bunch of old switches. Switches are expensive, as you know. But at a train show, those power routing switches, those old school ones you got to build yourself, that whole bag, there's like 50 switches in there. They were probably two bucks a piece or less. And they can be modified with considerable labor on your part. But they work. Now here, it's, here's another thing I want to talk about. Okay, as you can see, here's some nickel silver. Here's some brass, nickel silver. Uh, the piece you're missing here, I had a piece of steel track in here, which is on the workbench right now. I haven't cleaned this track in over a year, and it works just fine. Do you know why? Not only that, if you can see here, I don't solder my joints. And I don't solder them because I don't need to. The reason I don't solder them is because, as you can see, I use particle board. And particle board is that thing they tell you don't ever use particle board. Well, I use it. Not only that, I use brass track. Brass track, I use steel track, and I use particle board. Because where this wall is, when it is, there's a wind chill on this wall of this last winter, it was more than 50 below zero Fahrenheit. And I know there's going to be warping. So I don't solder the joints. So how do I get away with that? Well, I'm going to show you something here, right here. This is how I get away with it, ox guard. When I first installed this track, I cleaned it. Right here, you are looking at a brass switch that I painted with Walmart dark camouflage brown, and then I took a piece of 1,000 grit sandpaper, sanded the top, and coated it with ox guard, and it works just fine. There's no problem with it whatsoever. I haven't I haven't cleaned it at all in over one year, and I don't have a problem. Feeder wires. People wonder about, well, how far apart should I put feeder wires? Listen, on some track like that, there's a feeder wire down there about five, six feet from here. It don't matter. That, that track is, the track is the conductor. Right here, I have ox guarded the rail joiners all the way down here I've ox guarded everything down here as you can see I have a power district because I've got plastic rail joiners when when this track is fully tested and all the bugs are worked out um, I'm not gonna ballast it I'm going to flock it if you don't know what flocking is uh, you want to look for YouTube videos on how to replace G.I. Joe's hair. That's what flocking is. I'm going to flock this so it. this is an industrial park. It's going to look really, really industrial. But this brass track back here, all the way back to the back, cleaned one time like 16 months ago. 
still works just fine. No cleaning needed whatsoever. Um, if you modify your track, there is a film on here, a conductive film called OxGuard. It's conductive film on there. If you clean it with any method, then you want to coat it with OxGuard. After a while, at first, OxGuard is sticky because it's a dielectric grease, sticky, and then later it um, turns into a film which is totally conductive and works awesome. Here's a brass switch right here. And I'm mixing brass, nickel, silver, and steel. If you don't know what true steel track is for, well, don't use it. If you do know, then you know kind of why I'm incorporating a bit of steel track into here. If you are using a uh, Bachman Easy Track that is steel track, that's some good stuff. I'm going to tell you right now, that's awesome stuff. I had a test track on the floor in a loop for four straight years. It got stepped on every day, and it worked amazing. It never failed me. That loop, I'm going to put that loop back up again, and it's going to be fantastic. But here's the thing I want to tell you about feeder wires. Where do you need feeder wires? So they say, oh, every three feet. No, that's not entirely true. Because on these two tracks here that run around, there's like no feeder wires on these right now at all, and the track works just fine. The track itself is like a feeder wire. But let's look down here on a switch. Okay, so here's the thing. When you are rebuilding switches, you need to make sure there's power to this rail. That's not a good tool. Let's, let's use this one. Okay, you got to have power to this rail. you got to have power to that rail. On switches, you're going to need extra feeder wires. So back in here, I've got a bunch of feeder wires pulled up that run to my bus. What kind of feeder wires? That's the wire I use. Does it matter? No, not really. It doesn't matter. It could be the thinnest wire in the world. It doesn't matter because under here, I'm doing my feeder wires to a solid core 14 gauge wire that you get at the hardware store for an 18, 17 cents a foot. And I solder mine on. I do not use suitcase connectors because if you make a mistake with a suitcase connector, you have to cut it out. If I make a mistake, like you can see, there's one right there. There's a mistake right there. If you make a mistake, you just unsolder it. So I don't use suitcase connectors. I got a ton of them, but I found out the very first time I used them, you make a mistake, you're cutting it out. You solder a mistake, you just unsolder it and move on. So that's about it. I'm going to show you guys later how I rebuild switches. But for now, I'm going to put in... I had a steel switch right here. And I had a brass switch right here. That were both ancient 1960s power routing switches. Where... You can see right here. Okay, there's a switch... There's two little rivets there on a plastic piece. That is good to go DCC. That is good to go DCC. Uh, I don't have one on here on the workbench right now. But I have some that I rebuilt. This used to be power routing. As you can see, I've tried a number of things. This one here happens to be... I think epoxied to some slippery uh, blue plastic. So far, so good. This one here is soldered to some PC boards. Where's this glue? This might be plastic. Nope. Okay, this is plastic that is actually um, contact glued to some slippery blue plastic. I'm testing out that one. And this one here, 
that is PC board that I cut with the mill. Um, this, I believe, that is also... Nope, that's blue plastic and some PC board. So there's some soldering and some gluing going on. I'm testing them out. Here is a power routing switch where I've changed it to a fast tracks tie. I love that. And here is my hinge, which is slippery blue plastic, and I believe that might be super glue. So we'll see how that lasts. But anyways, I just wanted to give you guys a quick overview. Feeders. I'm going to talk more later about how to determine where you need feeders. You see this? This is my three feet. These tiles are 12 inches. And I need a bunch of feeders right here for various rails. But I have no feeders going back. I don't know how many feet that is. That is four and a half feet. Going back there, I don't need any feeders. And it's brass rail. No problem whatsoever. If you are thinking that you can't use brass rail, you are wrong. Brass rail works just fine. There's a brass rail switch right there. Works just fine. There's nothing wrong with brass rail. It looks different, but when you paint it and ballast it or scenic it, there's not anything at all wrong with it. And if you use OxGuard on it, you will literally not have to clean it for years. And it will be just fine. No problems whatsoever.